Good morning. Welcome to the Heritage Foundation and to our Lewis Lehrman Auditorium. We, of course, welcome those who join us on our heritage.org website on all of these occasions. Welcome those who are joining us today on C-SPAN as well. Would ask in-house if you'll check that cell phones have been turned off. It will be appreciated by all who are recording the events as well as our presenters. We will, of course, post our program within 24 hours on the Heritage homepage for those who would like to return for future reference. Hosting our discussion today is Stephen Bucci. Dr. Bucci is director of our Douglas and Sarah Allison Center for Foreign Policy Studies. He previously served as Heritage's Senior Research Fellow for Defense and Homeland Security. He served for three decades as an Army Special Forces Officer and top Pentagon official, including duties as military assistant to Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld, later serving as Assistant Secretary, Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense, Homeland Defense, and American Security Affairs. Please join me in welcoming my colleague, Stephen Bucci. Steve? Well, good morning, and uh, welcome to everyone watching both on uh, Heritage Streaming Video and uh, C-SPAN. Uh, this is the first public event of the, this year's Protect America Month. Uh, this, for the next month, we'll have a combination of public events like this one, panels and keynotes. Uh, we're going to have several uh, private uh, meetings with members of Congress and the administration and business folks. We have a series of guest bloggers that will be fe featured on the Heritage website over the course of the month, uh, mostly sitting congressmen and senators. Uh, and we also have several education events over on the Hill with uh, staff members for our legislative branch. Uh, the first week, we're going to focus on readiness. We're going to be looking at the hollow force uh, possibilities today. Uh, we're, we had uh, already had a private event on nuclear modernization and missile defense. Week two, we'll be looking at the budget impasse that we are facing and that is having so much effect on defense. Week three will focus on veterans and the uh, social, psychological, and economic issues that they face, as well as some private meetings on uh, defense entitlement reform. And then finally, week four, we will end with the future of national security. We'll look at threats, uh, possible paths forward, and we're going to end the week with a special event of the uh, unveiling of former Secretary of Defense Donald H. Rumsfeld's new book on leadership. Uh, mixed into that, we will also have a series of events for our newly founded National Security Law Center. Uh, they'll have two events this week, both their initial rollout and another one looking at detainee issues. Uh, and I would recommend that you all please check heritage.org. And for those here in the building with us, we have these flyers that are out uh, outside the auditorium that have the details of the events that are occurring here uh, in this building. Uh, I would like to take this time to intro our speakers, uh, and this is the order they're going to speak in. Uh, the first is uh, retired Colonel Kerry Kachijan. Uh, Kerry is a, a formy, former Army engineer. He served in Iraq, Afghanistan, and at uh, Hurricane Katrina response. Uh, he is, like myself, a graduate of the United States Military Academy. Uh, he is also a distinguished graduate from the Internet or Industrial College of the Armed Forces here in Washington, D.C. Uh, he has written a, a really interesting book. I would highly recommend it. It's called SUVs Suck in Combat. Uh, and the, the subtitle of it is uh, a little better. It's the, uh, the Reconstruction of Iraq During a Raging Insurgency. Uh, some really good insights into the difficulty of, of what we tried to do and, and a little bit of how we did it. Uh, he will be followed by uh, Baker Spring, our F.M. Kirby Research Fellow for National Security Policy. Baker is, uh, to put it bluntly, our numbers guy. Right? Baker is a recognized uh, true expert uh, in the how we take all of the the policy and the theory that we do in the defense business and actually make it happen. And that's by getting the right budgetary support and uh, spending the money that is allocated correctly and wisely. And uh, he'll be uh, looking at, at this uh, 
hollow force from that end. And then we're going to follow up with uh, retired U.S. Army Colonel Richard Dunn. Rich had 29 years in the Army and then 14 years in industry working for Northrop Grumman and SAIC. Uh, he has some very interesting points. His final uh, tour in the Army was as a director of the Chief of Staff of the Army's staff group. And for those non-Army folks, that's you're basically the idea guys for the Chief of Staff of the Army. Uh, and I'm guessing that whatever they call that staff group today, they're pretty busy right now. So he's going to have some an interesting uh, perspective there. And Rich has also authored for Heritage a paper on readiness. I regret it's not ready today, but it will be ready and out by the end of this month as part of our, our uh, Protect America Week or Protect America Month. So keep your eye out for that, and it will be available soon. All right, the hollow force. That, those are all the admin announcements. The hollow force. Uh, this is not the same problem that Rich and Kerry and I faced low many years ago. I don't know if you quite faced it. What year did you graduate? 82. 82. So I saw some of it in Germany. Yeah, he's, he, he got the tail end of it. Rich and I were sort of dead in the middle of it in, in the late 70s, post-Vietnam. Uh, it's a little different problem now. But what is the same is the uncertainty and the concern and the potential danger if we don't address it properly. Uh, and I have a concern about this because while I am now wearing a suit and working here at Heritage, Captain Bucci, my younger son, is still out there in the force, and he is now dealing with it. He takes command of a, of a company this week, and uh, he is going to have to deal with the, the problems of the hollow force. Uh, what I'm going to ask our speakers to do as soon as I sit down here is they're going to take about 10 or 12 minutes each to give some opening remarks, throw some meat out there to the audience, uh, and then we're going to use the bulk of the time for Q&A, and hopefully we'll get a, a little bit of a discussion going here because this is a problem that we all need to address, not just the technical experts, though we obviously are, are pretty blessed to have uh, three of them here today, but uh, something this whole nation has to have a conversation over and address properly. Uh, when I do get to the Q&A, and I'll remind you of this, uh, we have uh, folks with microphones. Raise your hand. I will acknowledge you. I'd like you to identify yourself and then ask a question. And I always throw this in here because it makes John Hibbolt very happy. But uh, if at the end of the second sentence I don't hear a question mark, then I'm going to ask you to sit down. So we, you know, if you want to come here and be part of a panel, let us know afterwards. We'll see what we can work out. But you're not on the dais today. So we'll just get questions, and then we'll let our experts deal with them. So right now, we'll start with Kerry. Steve, thanks for that kind introduction, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to come here today. It's my honor to be here. Um, so what does a hollow force mean to U.S. national security? Well, quite simply, it means our nation can't defend itself properly. Uh, it has a greatly diminished capacity to generate the trained, equipped, and ready forces that are needed to conduct current missions, to provide replacement units, and to prepare for future threats. Our military is a national insurance policy. Its primary purpose is to deter war. And if it needs to fight a war, you want it to do as quickly as and inexpensively as it can. And you'd measure that in lives and treasury. Armed forces, their families, and their equipment have been heavily worn over the past 10 years of war. Now is an excellent time to rebalance our forces, but not gut them. We have an opportunity to reshape the force and the acquisition system that supports it. Our military is the finest, best trained and equipped fighting force in the world, but training, equipment, and personnel are highly perishable and uh, if they're not properly maintained. Our military may soon have inadequate capacity to cover all of the global security commitments and missions that it has been assigned. The military will likely not meet the expectations of the nation. The force will be greatly stressed just to keep up with its current operations. It takes uh, a decade or more to build a solid military force but it only requires a couple of years to lose that benefit of that national investment. 
Look at what happened to the Soviet Union after it suffered massive atrophy of its armed forces when communism collapsed in the early 90s. 20 years later, it's still on a long path to recovery. Now, I want to give you a couple of personal examples of, that are relevant to this discussion. So I witnessed the tail end of the hollow army during my first tour in Europe. And then I'm going to fast forward and give you some examples from Iraq, some, some things, that, observations from there. So I arrived in Germany as a young lieutenant in the early 80s. The Army's job was to stop the Soviet Union from attacking Western Europe. My platoon's wartime mission was to emplace minefields, to blow up bridges, and to slow down thousands of Soviet tanks and armored vehicles. But this was after Vietnam. Our government had dramatically cut the defense budget, and the impact was immediately obvious to me. I was responsible for five military vehicles and 40 men. Due to budget cuts, None of my military vehicles were working. Matter of fact, I had empty parking spaces. They were all sent to some higher level maintenance for months. There was no money for repair parts. Our military vehicles were averaging 30 years old. The Army could not afford to buy new ones. If war broke out, we had no way to travel the 150 miles to the border to defend our sector. The defensive obstacles that we were supposed to in place would have not been in place in time. The Soviets would have captured key bridges, airfields, and major cities. That would have resulted in dramatically increased casualties among our fighting forces. Now, the military will always have unexpected missions. So you want those forces to be as flexible and adaptable and as well-trained as possible, because our enemy will always go after what they perceive to be a weakness. In, my, in Iraq, my Army Reserve team was sent on an unbelievable mission, and that was to rebuild Iraq while it was fighting a raging insurgency. And the progress of this mission was of national importance. It was reported daily to the SECDEF and sometimes POTUS. But no military unit existed in peacetime that was prepared to go rebuild countries. And so the Army hastily created a special new unit, which we called the Gulf Region Division, and it only got a few weeks to be organized during the war to staff it, to equip it, to train it, to deploy it, and send it straight into combat to begin rebuilding thousands of projects while our other forces were fighting the insurgency. To make things even more complicated, 90% of this new force were civilians, and they were uh, experts, all volunteers. And so they began this very quickly organized, large, complex, and dangerous uh, reconstruction project uh, one of the largest ever undertaken by our nation. But we had critical equipment shortfalls. There were no spare military equipment for us, for our division. We went to war with what we had. We had to quickly acquire everything else. We improvised, adapted, and outsourced. We had no military weapons, or no crew serve weapons, no military radios, or military vehicles assigned to us, and we were going into combat. My team borrowed weapons, so uh, M4 rifles, and we didn't have ammunition because we were a low priority unit. We went out and wrote our own personal checks, bought our own ammunition out of our own pocket to fire our weapons before going into combat. Security, there was no extra forces available, no spare infantry to protect our personnel, our convoys, or our project sites. We hired hundreds of security contractors that we had never trained with. Our security contractor teams used Russian weapons and ammo because they were much easier to acquire in that part of the world. Vehicles. When we arrived in Iraq, there were no spare military vehicles available. So we leased 200 sport utility vehicles. Everyone's got a sport utility vehicle in their driveway? A lot of you do? Some of you do, right? We're talking about Toyota Land Cruisers and those kinds of things. 200 of them. And we drove around in combat in those and only 12 of those, because they were hastily acquired, 12 of the 200, were factory armored. The rest were simply commercial vehicles. And so during combat, we were going on the Internet and urgently buying aftermarket armor kits that we could uh, in flew these kits into Baghdad, set up our own garage, and started to install these add-on armor kits to our SUVs. That made them 2,000 pounds overweight. That means their brakes wore out early, and they were top-heavy so they could roll over but we had to do it because we had no other alternative. Our SUVs were bullet magnets. We drove as fast as we could to avoid IEDs and ambushes and to get the civilian experts to the project sites. 
It was like living in a Mad Max movie. We would rip off the tailgates of the SUVs, put a tail gunner in there with a Russian PKM machine gun because our enemy would drive up in BMWs at 110 miles an hour and shoot us from behind. I'm going to show you a couple pictures. We would hang duct tape with your personal body armor. We would hang or duct tape personal body armor, what you wear, on the outside of the vehicle to try to stop some incoming rounds and absorb some blasts from IEDs. And I think I have some charts. I just want to show a couple of quick pictures because I think a visual tells a thousand words. Is it over here? Okay. So these were the thousands of project sites, all those dots. This is the stuff we were trying to do, all the projects we were trying to rebuild during a war. And so this is the kind of thing we had because this unit didn't exist before and had to go hastily go acquire things. Leasing sport utility vehicles. You can see the SUVs out. You can see a tail gunner here. That's a contractor security. Your tires, probably pneumatic. If they get shot out in combat, you're in your own coffin in the middle of the street. Uh, the radios, let me get into the rest of it. Um, radios, we had no military radios that could communicate with other American forces. We went out and bought off-the-shelf radios because we could get them immediately so that we could at least communicate within our own reconstruction forces and so they weren't interoperable with other U.S. Uh, units. Intelligence, many of our security contractors did not have security clearances. So providing them unclassified intelligence about threats was a continuous challenge. This did work to our advantage one time. We accidentally rescued a hostage. Our guys were lost. They couldn't find their way around the battlefield. They went into an Iraqi village to get directions, and they accidentally stumbled into an American hostage who was being held, spooked the guard, and the guy was probably going to be sold off to al-Qaeda and beheaded. And he's alive now because we had bad information systems and bad intelligence. So Murphy's Law of Combat works both ways, but it's rare. And you don't want to count on that. We lost scores of people during our mission, largely because they were not trained or equipped for this unexpected mission. Things got better over time. But the first year or two of what we had to go through were particularly tough. So my summary is we need, going forward, flexible forces that are properly resourced trained and equipped to be prepared for our future conflicts. Now, I have some ideas about how to prevent uh, some of the hollow force from occurring, and I will share them during the question and answer period. So that's all I have. I'm out of bullets at the minute, at the moment, and I will yield the floor. Thank you. Thanks. You can probably take that down. Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to talk about uh, what I think is going to clearly become a pressing issue. Uh, uh, in a sense, I guess I'm the Colonel's worst nightmare. I'm the guy that looks at this systematically and from 10,000 layers up, as opposed to the poor people who have to deal with the practical realities of a hollow force on the ground. Uh, but that is my perspective, and so that's the one I'm going to focus on today, because I think there's some important things to to look at with regard to the hollow force we may be facing compared to past uh, experience. Um, uh, I can assure you that it is only coincidental that uh, my opening quote here comes from uh, my boss, James Carafano, uh, as being a good career move, but uh, <laughs> uh, let me start there. Um, uh, about a year ago, um, the vice president here at Heritage, James Carafano, stated the following about a hollow force, and I quote, a military that looks good on paper but can't adequately defend the country is the definition of a hollow force. A military force becomes hollow when it lacks sufficient capabilities to field trained and ready forces, conduct current missions, and prepare for future threats. If a military can't do all three well, it is hollow. It can't really deliver on the government's promise to provide for the common defense, unquote. James's observation is exactly right. This means that there is the possibility, if not the likelihood, that a hollow force that existed at one time will have different characteristics than a hollow force in another era. Today, as we face the prospect of another hollow force, the temptation exists to deny the problem because of the use of a metric that is derived from the specific characteristics of the hollow force that existed in the 1970s following the Vietnam War. It became increasingly clear that the hollow forces uh, it is becoming increasingly clear that the hollow forces 
that are all but certain to emerge will have fundamentally different characteristics than that of the late 1970s. Having said that, however, there is one common characteristic that I think will exist between the two. This is the ad inadequate overall funding for defense. Specifically, the U.S. cut its defense budget too deeply following Vietnam, the Vietnam War and seems to be heading in the same direction in anticipation of the conclusion of the operations both in Iraq earlier and now with Afghanistan. So let me do a, uh, uh, a bird's eye view of, of, of how I would compare these two hollow forces, the one from the late 70s, mid to late 70s, and the one that, we, that we, I think we will be uh, facing uh, in the near future. First of all, let me deal with the, with the issues of what was not the problem associated with the hollow force of the late 1970s. One, the problem, at least by today's standards, was not that the military was too small. Let me give you some of the statistics on that. In the 1970s, uh, specifically FY 1976, the U.S. military had an active and reserve component M strength of over 2.9 million persons, uh, much larger than today's. Strategic nuclear forces, it's almost silly to compare. Um, in 1976, we had 2,100 strategic nuclear delivery platforms, meaning ICBMs, SLBMs, and nuclear-capable bombers, and roughly 10,000 deployed warheads. We had 24 active and reserve divisions in the Army. We had 110 fighter and attack squadrons in the, uh, uh, in the Air Force. Um, and while it's a little bit of a different uh, uh, accounting, um, we had 550 overall ships. That's, a, that's almost like everything, including cats and dogs. So it, it's, it's a little bit different, but those were the records that I could find. The, also, the problem was not, believe it or not, completely insufficient modernization funding. It may have been misapplied, but the scope of the funding was relatively good. We had about 31% of our total defense budget. That includes DOD and non-DOD um, going to the modernization counts of research and development and procurement. Another problem, one thing that was not a problem also in at least the mid to late 1970s is we didn't have an extraordinarily high operational tempo. Uh, obviously, Vietnam War was, was uh, over, um, and the United States was not, at least at that point, taking on new long duration or, or, or wide scope military operations. What were the problems in the, in the 70s? First of all, and pretty much at the head of the list, was lower quality personnel. And one of the things that showed that was that uh, there were drops in education levels and test scores. Uh, we had low morale. Now, some of this had to do with the cultural um, uh, circumstances that uh, existed in the United States writ large at that particular point in time. Um, and one of the things that was uh, notable about that was the uh, increases in bad discharges. Insufficient pay. Um, in the 1970s, largely due to inflation as well as, uh, as fiscal constraints, uh, base pay declined by almost 20 percent in inflation-adjusted terms from 1972 levels by 1980. So insufficient pay was a significant problem. Recruitment and retention problems, extraordinarily bad. Uh, it resulted in one of four military services failing to meet its recruitment goals in each of the fiscal years 1976 through 1980. And the services were finding that there were significant shortfalls as it relates to retention in experienced personnel for important military specialties at that time. Inadequate training and maintenance. Um, along with the personnel issues, uh, this led to readiness problems. For example, in FY 1979, six of ten Army divisions based in the U.S. were assessed as not combat ready. Now let's look at the, at the emerging hollow force, at least as I see it. What are not the problems? What I don't think is a problem, at least at the moment, now it could become worse, but at the moment at least, I think that recruitment and retention rates are going to be relatively good. Uh, uh, the services seem to be able to, to, to meet uh, their goals. Now I have to admit to some extent this has to do with the soft labor market and the fact that the military is shrinking. The second is, is that morale seems fairly high. Um, particularly in the aftermath of the stress uh, of the stress in coming in the aftermath of the long-term combat operations that were undertaken in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, now there are some pockets of concern. The high suicide rate worries me quite a bit. 
Compensation is not insufficient. Um, and let me look at this uh, in a little more detail. Overall compensation for military personnel is relatively high today. For example, regular military compensation in 2011 for enlisted personnel exceeded $52,000 and on, a on average, and for officers over $100,000, while the U.S. median household income is about $50,000. Further, the deferred and in-kind benefit components of overall military compensation are generally more generous uh, than those found in the private sector. Uh, so that I believe that as it relates to, to compensation, um, we're obviously in a far, far better position today than we were in the 1970s. In fact, the Department of Defense is being forced by circumstances to look to actually try and restrain uh, future growth in, uh, in compensation. <coughs> now, what are the problems that I think that are, that are going to be associated with the emerging uh, hollow force? One is size, a shrinking force. Now, let me do some comparisons here. In terms of personnel, we're basically at about 2.3 million persons in the active and reserve component combined in the military. That's about 23 percent below what it was in 1976. Strategic nuclear forces, again, it's almost silly to compare. We have 806 strategic nuclear delivery vehicles and roughly, they're not being public about this, um, 2,000 real as opposed to accountable warheads. And we're moving to decline further under the, uh, the new Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty, New START. Obviously, this is a small fraction of what we had in the, in the 1970s. Army force structure. Combined active and reserve component, component uh, Army Brigade combat team stands at 73 and are scheduled to go to 65 uh, and could be reduced by f a further increment under sequestration. Air Force tactical squadrons, uh, the number is 63 combined uh, active and reserve component Air Force fighter and attack squadrons. That compared to well over 100 and the 1970s. Fleet size, currently we're at about 285 Navy ships, acknowledging that that's a slightly different accounting rule uh, than what uh, was available for me to find with regard to the 70s. What's the second problem? A lack of modernization funding. The procurement and research and development accounts now constitute just 28 percent of the total defense budget, and I believe that they're going to come down significantly from there because of the ongoing impact of sequestration. Uh, I think that sequestration is all but certain to hit over the lo longer term the modernization accounts harder. There are some issues in the immediate fiscal year with regard to, to, to training and, uh, and uh, uh, maintenance, uh, but I think that those will actually be um, addressed in the long term even if there are on, uh, ongoing um, uh, sequestration impacts. Aging weapons and equipment, let me just give an example. Uh, or a couple of examples. Uh, the Air Force has the C-5A cargo aircraft. It's now, which are generally are now between 35 and 40 years old. The average age of the V-52, if you're concerned about our nuclear deterrent, at least that component that's nuclear capable, um, that fleet is about 60 years old. The average age of the Navy's fleet is such that it's retiring ships faster than it's building them. Um, and so that uh, it's important to point out that this is not just a problem that's from the here and now. This is actually, a, to a certain degree, a very large degree, in my judgment, a holdover or an after effect of the procurement holiday budgets of the late of the, late, of the uh, 1990s. Um, another problem is the high maintenance costs that are going hand in hand with regard to the relatively um, uh, aged weapon systems. Let me take the C-5A example again. Uh, that aircraft uh, has a mission capable rate now of approximately 50 percent, and this is maintained only at the cost of really intense maintenance efforts. Um, so that if you don't have modern weapons and equipment, you also pay a readiness price for that um, because they are just harder to maintain. The final thing is, uh, is, is, is a little bit more uh, a question of uncertainty, and that is whether we will have higher operational tempo rates. Um, than we had in the 1970s. Clearly, they're going to come down from the extraordinary levels that we had um, in the aftermath of 9-11. Uh, of but the world is a more chaotic place today, and we've seen short-noticed operations of limited scope with regard to Libya and maybe on the cusp of one with Syria. Um, 
But nonetheless, this is coming in the context where the funding line for overseas contingency operations, or OCO, is likely to come down dramatically in the next two years, maybe even to zero. Um, so that there's going to be a spillover effect from that because I think that actually those OCO monies are doing things for resetting the force that some might describe as inherently OCO, but nonetheless have an incredible impact with regard to the overall readiness uh, of the force. So OCO funding uncertainty is, uh, is a real key issue here. So what's the bottom line message here? It is that we'll have a different kind of hollow force if my assessment is correct, um, uh, for the remainder of, uh, of this decade um, than what we had in the 1970s. Um, basically, I think that in the case of the 1970s, the, the, the hollowness can be described as stemming from a force of significant size and possessing reasonably modern weapons and equipment, but that suffered from serious personnel problems and a lack of, of commitment to keeping those forces in fighting trim. In the case of the one that's emerging, I think it's going to be a problem of a force that's too small and, not lack, and lacking truly modern weapons and equipment. Those are two fundamentally different things. But let me say is, is there is one common element, and that is, is the question of inadequate funding levels. And basically this comes down to how much you cut your defense budgets in the aftermath of large-scale military operations. By 1975, the DOD budget fell by 31 percent from the Vietnam War high in 1968 in real dollar terms. Inflation was a serious problem then. Um, current projections of the DOD budget based on Obama administration requested levels shows a reduction of 28 percent between FY 2010 and FY 2014, again in real dollar terms. However, this latter one does not assume the, assume the uh, application of sequestration beyond the current fiscal year. Um, and the other thing is the, is the uncertainty with regard to OCO funding. Um, but I would not be surprised that we had the unhappy coincidence of exactly the same 31 percent reduction in the defense budget post-Vietnam being applied in terms of the emerging hollow force I think that we're going to face. And I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Always great to follow a speaker with such uh, cheerful uh, points. So I, I'd like to, <laughs> I'd like to uh, to thank the uh, th thank first the audience for uh, for your interest in the uh, in the preparedness of our armed forces, and second I'd like to thank uh, Heritage Foundation for the opportunity to share a couple thoughts uh, with you on that subject, which is as uh, Steve mentioned is, is very near and dear to uh, to my heart. Um, there are two different dimensions to military preparedness, multiple dimensions really, but on, on one hand you have the question of do we have an adequate number of the right sorts of forces, the number of air squadrons, aircraft carrier, battle groups, army brigades and so forth uh, to meet the, uh, the threats that we foresee. But the second issue is uh, what is the condition of those forces and that is really their readiness for combat and that's the question that I would like to uh, to share a couple of thoughts with you on, on, on this morning. Uh, combat readiness is really defined as the ability of the U.S. forces to fight and meet the demands of the national military strategy. Now, this is, this is as you can imagine, of utmost importance uh, to our service members, uh, but it's a rather complicated and difficult to understand subject. Uh, it's very multidimensional, as I'll get into in a minute, and it's a very diffuse thing. So, therefore, it has very few natural constituencies. I mean, you can get a constituency for building fighter aircraft. You know, they're manufactured in like 45 different states. When you say, where's your constituency for, for, for training? And you, and you don't find one. So that, it makes it very difficult to really build a political constituency that is gonna, uh, gonna support military uh, readiness, combat readiness uh, for our armed forces. Uh, and so as you have this increasingly fierce competition for for resources at the national level, there's always the danger that we're going to do something very foolish uh, in this regard and we're going to put ourselves at risk. Uh, so the, the, the point I would make is that to be ready to fight uh, effectively, forces have to be manned, they have to be equipped, and they have to be trained to operate 
under dangerous, complex, uncertain, and austere conditions, sometimes with very little advance warning. That means you have to have the right personnel operating the right equipment with the right training to win. So readiness, when you try to think about it, is kind of like a three-legged stool. Um, you can have the most modern equipment uh, out there, but if it's sitting around in a motor pool or the end of a flight line, it never gets flown uh, without having, because you don't have the, the, the highly trained personnel that you need it, uh, it's useless. And conversely, if you have uh, really great personnel, but their, their equipment is non-functional, you know, like five out of five uh, uh, of your pieces of equipment sitting in your roll pool won't work. Uh, it's, it's not uh, working. And, and you have to be able to train all this to put all these things together. So you need to think about how you maintain balance. If you have a three-legged stool and you need to reduce it and you start cutting off one leg at a time, you really start to put the, the value of the whole thing uh, at risk. So uh, the point I would make is that maintaining an appropriate balance among these different dimensions is essential to maintaining overall combat effectiveness. And if we're unable to do so during our current period of uh, budgetary uncertainty, we could seriously degrade our ability to respond to unanticipated threats in our strategic interests worldwide. And I think if you, if you look at the current era right now, this is really an era of strategic uncertainty. It's not like the Cold War, we had a known threat and so forth. We don't know what's gonna happen tomorrow uh, in the Middle East, on the Korean Peninsula, uh, in Boston. So we have to, we have a great amount of uncertainty that we need to be able uh, to, uh, to cover and maintaining this balance between personnel, uh, equipment and the equipment, uh, maintenance of that equipment and training is very, very important as, as we move forward. Unfortunately, uh, when you look at the historical experience, uh, it repeatedly shows that unanticipated events often catch us by surprise. And then as mentioned earlier, we end up paying a high price in blood and treasure uh, for fixing that. Uh, because we're not ready for either the scope of the conflict or the nature of the conflict that, uh, that we have to deal with. If you take a quick look at some of the, uh, the history lessons, and I'm not going to get into history in, in great depth right now, but World War II we were, we were tremendously unprepared for despite uh, what had been going on in Europe for a long time because we were not going to be engaged in the war. Uh, and finally, when we were able to produce a lot of materiel, the tanks and aircraft and so forth, <coughs> making us the arsenal of democracy, uh, we were able to equip the force quite well, but the training took about three years of hard combat. And people forget what happened uh, with the debacle in the Philippines at places like the Kazarine Pass, where tremendously unprepared American forces were just uh, uh, suffered uh, devastating setbacks uh, by the enemy. And you know, we kind of look at the end, you know, but, uh, but it took a while to get there. So after World War uh, II, the message, of course, was no more Pearl Harbors. And that was, the, that was the theme that everybody who was sitting in this version of a room back then was saying, no more Pearl Harbors. Well, guess what happened? Five years after, uh, after the end of World War II, uh, we don't need ground combat forces anymore. We have the A-bomb. North Korea invades South Korea, remember that? And we send a task force to the command of, uh, under the command of, a, of an officer by the name of Smith from 24th Infantry Division. Uh, from Japan, where they've been on occupation duty, to Korea. They run into the North Koreans. The, the North Koreans just ran right through them. Massive loss of life. Uh, and again, at the end of the Korean War, the motto was, no more task force spits. Uh, and then we have Vietnam. And in Vietnam, if you ran uh, Andy Krepp and Evans's book, we had forces, but the forces were prepared for major combat operations against a, a mechanized Soviet army in Europe. They were not prepared for counterinsurgency operations in the, in the jungles in Vietnam. Uh, in Desert Storm, uh, Desert Shield, fortunately, we were given about six months to get there in the desert. We were able to deploy forces, mostly from Europe. Uh, and we did a great job on that one. But then later on, we faced what had happened. Uh, we had the phases of, uh, of the, uh, of the uh, Iraq War, where we did find uh, getting all the way to Baghdad, what we were unprepared to deal with the counterinsurgency operations. And you just heard, heard Terry talk about some of the consequences like that. So while history is never going to repeat itself, we ought to at least learn uh, some, uh, some insights. As my, my dad always uh, tells me, he says, always learn from your past mistakes. You can make new and exciting ones in the, uh, in the, in the future. So first thing I would say is when you look at history, our ability to predict these emerging threats uh, is very imperfect. Uh, even when we've had uh, essentially a, 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 the, uh, a case where we had the option to deploy force, we've had less than, well less than a year uh, in all these different cases uh, to, to get ready for it. 
Uh, and the second point is that uh, readiness degrades very quickly. In a matter of months, your training and so forth, it will rapidly uh, decrease. And the force that did something six months ago is not the force that's prepared to do it uh, tomorrow. And it's also very much situational. You may be prepared to defeat the Soviets in the, uh, in the plains of Europe, but you're not prepared to deal with, uh, with an insurgency. Uh, and the other part uh, we really need to pay attention to, do, to today is that leaders who are trained and developed under one set of circumstances may not be, have the, the mental agility to, uh, to prepare for the other. So leaving, leaving the historical record, let's take a quick look at a couple of things. Number one, I'd want you to understand that the military operations are extremely complex. I know we have a lot of veterans here in the, uh, uh, in the, uh, in the audience, but unless you've been there on the ground and you try to orchestrate air, sea, land, uh, armor, uh, supply, and so forth, it's an extremely complex uh, operation. Uh, and so it's done by a, essentially a combined arms or in some cases a, a joint team where everybody has to know their role. And if you don't have a, and you can have very quickly, you can have a single point of failure. It's like having a football team does a great job, gets within field goal range, someone says, where's the kicking team? And there is no kicking team because you haven't uh, got that, uh, that part of the force. So the poor point I would make there is um, a, it's a joint team that's only as strong as its weakest link, and we need to, need to keep that as we look forward to it. So what are some of the different dimensions of readiness? Well, the first thing you look at, as we talked about earlier, is personnel. You've got to bring in the right people, smarts. I mean, this is not, uh, you know, the ability to, to, uh, to do uh, high school level stuff. You're talking about graduate level uh, sorts of things that you're asking your armed forces to do today uh, with some of the technologies that you're using. You need to bring these people in, people of highest quality. You need to be able to train them so they have the individual skills to do that. And then you need to be able to retain them. They need, you need to, you can't just keep training uh, new people as they come and you're really not very effective at doing that. So you need to keep them in. You need to have leadership. Leadership is the catalyst that, that often pulls uh, uh, victory from the, uh, from, uh, uh, from the feet, and that's, that's tremendously important. Because all this contributes to morale. A great quote from uh, Napoleon who said that the morale is to the physical is three is to one absolutely applies today. If you have an ill-trained force, not well-equipped, uh, living in the substandard conditions, the morale is not likely to be very high. They're not likely to perform very well. So personnel, the first leg of the stool, if you will. Second is equipment. Uh, and there's two pieces to that. The first is do they have the right stuff? Do they have the number of airplanes, tanks, and so forth they're supposed to have? And the second part is, does that stuff operate? Is it broken down? Is it sitting there in the motor pool because you can't get repair parts for it? So both of those are very, very important, and the maintenance and repair of all this stuff are absolutely critical. Also training. Training is the easiest thing to cut because it's, uh, you know, you don't buy uh, uh, training in, in, in big bunches so there's no big constituency for it. But you have to be able to get people uh, out there uh, and do tough, realistic, demanding training. Another favorite quote uh, from Army guys, anyway, is from uh, Field War Marshal Erwin uh, Rommel, who said that the, the best form of welfare for troops is first-class training, for this saves unnecessary casualties. So how well the forces are trained is, 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 is tremendously important, and it's also a tremendous confidence builder. Some of the exercises that are going on in Korea this last couple of weeks for uh, uh, Eighth Army and all the other uh, elements of uh, U.S. forces, Korea and throughout the Pacific, have participated with our Korean uh, allies in combined operations. Tremendous confidence builder uh, in the ability of both of those forces to operate together. So that's a very important thing to look at. So why is all this at risk? Why are we doing, what are the concerns that, uh, that, that Baker has identified? Well, one of it is that you're going to come up with imbalance. Uh, the personnel accounts, the operation and maintenance accounts, uh, and the procurement accounts are all handled separately. So you have different people looking at all these different things. So they're saying, cut his leg of the stool and, and not hers. Uh, and there's a risk that you're, that you're going to do that. Um, in addition, some of the things like training, you can reduce the number of pair parts, it's easy to do, right? You can reduce the number of flight hours that you give people and reduce the amount of fuel that's available. Uh, you can't buy nine-tenths of an aircraft carrier. So training becomes a, a quick, easy bill payer. The other thing easy to reduce is, is, uh, is maintenance, not running things through depots or not buying repair parts. And then you have to open these huge backlogs of things that, uh, you know, okay, if you throw money at it, you can't buy the stuff. There's no time to repair things before you have to send people uh, off to, uh, to, to combat. So the, the point I would leave you with is that uh, it's very important uh, as, we, as we downsize the military, which I think we're going to do, 
Uh, I mean, it's probably very difficult to make the argument to sustain things given the current uh, budget and so forth at the levels that they are right now. But we have to be smart about it. We have to make sure that we maintain balance among the personnel, uh, the equipment that they have, the maintenance of that equipment, and the training that's available to them so that you don't end up with, a, uh, with an unbalanced uh, and ineffective force. So I, again, I, I thank you for your uh, interest and uh, look forward to your questions. All right, everybody, bright and sunny after all that, ready to go? <laughs> all right, uh, with our, our microphone folks, get in place and, and we'll take some questions. I'm going to ask the first one, then you'll go next. All right, uh, and this may actually be a good one for the end, but I'm going to ask it at the beginning anyway. Mm -hmm. I would like each of you to give me what is the first and best single step we could take to mitigate the dangers uh, that we're facing with a potential hollow force. And you can go in whatever order you want. Want me to, want me to start? Okay, go ahead. Um, the best thing I think, you've got to have some sort of metric. You have to be, have some way of looking at the problem. We have a, a relatively sophisticated uh, defense readiness reporting system. Uh, and it crunches all the numbers. But it's a, number one, it's a backwards looking indicator, shows you what you have right now uh, in the motor pools as a consequence of things. But it doesn't look like things like the, the uh, uh, the training, the individual training of your personnel. You know, you, you cut out contractors in some place and so forth. They're training that, uh, that uh, radar technician who's absolutely created keeping the whole fighter force available. Those sorts of things. So we, we need to have a holistic ability to look at all these different dimensions of readiness uh, and, and, uh, and what's happening to them as we make some of these, uh, these changes that may have uh, much longer term consequences than we anticipate. Uh, for me, it's very simple. Resolve the budget impasse and set aside sequestration and don't cut the defense budget as much as would be likely to occur um, as we stand here today. Okay. So I have some thoughts on long-term, mid-term, and short-term. Let me just hit the long-term one. We need to strengthen our economy. The source of our military strength derives from our economic strength. Our political strength derives from our economic strength. And so it's all about the economy. And so the best thing we can do is get our economy healthy again provide a business environment that will lead to hiring people and skilled jobs, grow the revenue base, and get more resources for investment so that we can maintain the readiness levels that we need. That's the big strategic thing to do. It may not be the short-term thing to do. It may it's going to take a while. Okay. All right. This gentleman right here. And please identify yourself and ask the question. Uh, excellent presentation. My name is Doug Brooks. I'm a uh, consultant with the stability operations industry. Uh, and I really enjoyed particularly the presentation on the Gulf Regional Division, uh, GRD. And it seems to me the first thing that, that gets cut out of any uh, budget is stability operations capability, despite the fact that for the past 12 decades, we've been involved in stability operations. How do we ensure that this stays in the budget, even though it's a fraction of the cost of all these other big ticket items? Right, great question. It's about priorities, right? You used to have 10 bucks. Now you got seven. You're going to rack and stack them, you know, and you got, you got 50 missions. You can afford four of them. It's about priorities. And uh, now that said, you know, the Army has taken steps. They've stood up now an enduring organization out in Winchester, Virginia, called the Transatlantic Division that's supposed to at least provide the cadre and the structure. But as we speak, it's getting extremely lean. And a lot of the people that have the experience and the subject matter expertise, they eventually grow up and retire and move on to other things, and you lose, lose all of that knowledge and understanding. So you've got to capture all that, institutionalize it, and guess what? You've got to train it. You can't learn how to conduct stability and reconstruction operations or other types of military operations in combat. You've got to do it, and it's interagency. It's not just the Department of Defense on the battlefield. State Department, USAID, you go through the list, they're all out there on the battlefield, and we don't practice with them. And so if we want to do it bad again, we can do it bad again. I'd like to do it better. Uh, let me just say that uh, in this particular case, I think that the problem starts at the head, and that's a policy problem. The strategic guidance is explicitly clear that maintaining long-term sustained stability operations is not a vital interest of the United States. Um, and so that the policy is going to, um, uh, it runs exactly counter to what was just recommended. 
So uh, uh, counterinsurgency, stability, all those kinds of things are all debatable about where they fit in the priority scheme. But if you don't want it to happen again, you got to train it. But it's a question of priorities and funding. And so we got to mitigate risk, right? And so what's the minimum I can do, the minimum investment? So I, if we have to do it again, you know, I, I mean, the last time we probably did it was Vietnam. But then after, but, but then uh, we did some of it during Vietnam. But then after the uh, first Gulf War, they rebuilt Kuwait, but that was peacetime. When we rebuilt uh, Germany, that was peacetime. I, you know, we need to seriously think about the policy issues here. Is this something we want to do? How much is our responsibility? If Korea breaks loose, okay, what's the U.S. going to do about it post-conflict? So those are policy issues. I'm not saying that we should or shouldn't do it. We should understand what it is, understand the risks, and make prudent investments to mitigate those risks. If I could just add one point, you know, when, you, when you're prioritizing things over there in the Pentagon, uh, you have to look at, you know, how much time would be available to fix things. If we don't have it right right now, do I have, you know, two days or six months or, or years and so forth? So to echo one of the points that uh, that uh, Kerry's making is you, you don't want to lose that, that expertise. Uh, I was, I, I was a, as you can tell from my gray hair, I was a Vietnam veteran. I, I served in, uh, I was in the advisory role out on the Cambodian border. Uh, and we really knew how to do what we now call stability operations, counterinsurgency. We had it down pat, and, and probably everybody who was serving in the Army then did. So, you know, fast forward, when I'm seeing what happened in, uh, in Iraq after Baghdad fell in the insurgency, I said, what is the matter with these people? What happened to all of these lessons learned? And they were gone. Uh, and so the, uh, all of those lessons learned from Vietnam became lessons relearned at a very expensive cost. So, okay, you've got time to put that back together again, but you have to have you know, do that, that critical strategic investment, mostly in the knowledge base, so you're able to reconstitute that if necessary. And it's not a big cost. It's a function of, of giving a little bit of focus to it. And, and I'll tell you, the lessons that were the most painful to learn, generally institutions like the military and the U.S. government want to forget about because they were painful. <laughs> and unfortunately, we can't, by fiat, decide we're not going to have to be involved with them again. Another question. All the way in the back. My name is Joseph uh, Cowley from Sky News Arabia. Um, after the um, Afghanistan war and the Iraq war, do you think that the United States is weakened and that's why we're not taking any decisions toward what's happening right now in, in Syria? And how the U.S. military is going to prepare itself in a mutant future, technology-wise, military-wise? Um, are we getting weaker? I think absolutely we are, but we're doing that by choice, not by circumstance. In other words, I don't think that it was inherently the case that we would get weaker or necessarily the case that we will get weaker just because of the, um, of the stress that was placed on the force in the combined uh, operations in, uh, in Afghanistan and Iraq. Uh, Primarily, in my judgment, what we're seeing here is we're getting weaker um, because the budget priorities um, in Washington are shifting. Um, some of that is understandable because of the circumstances of the economy that were just explained here. Others of it are not nearly so defensible. Um, so that uh, uh, I think that uh, at, at the end of the day, um, this is something that we're doing by choice, not by circumstance. Let me follow up on that. Um, it's, it's not that the military capability is not there. It's a question of national will. Uh, and obviously, I think the experience in both Iraq and Afghanistan will very much f uh, flavor the response to uh, what's going on in, <coughs> in Syria and the potential uh, expansion of that conflict. Uh, and again, I <coughs> apologize for using historical analog, but after Vietnam, you couldn't pay people enough to get back into counterinsurgency operations, but the threat did not go away, uh, particularly in Central America. So you saw major uh, insurgencies, uh, communist-led insurgencies in Nicaragua uh, and in El Salvador. The U.S. had to respond to those. The response used was very, very different 
uh, than the response used in, uh, in, in Vietnam. So I think if you have someone from whomever think tank walks over the hill and said, you know the solution to these sorts of problems is to put large U.S. ground formations on the ground and have them shoot up the countryside for a few years, it's probably going to be offered a short walk into the uh, Potomac. So what you will see, I think, is something that's very, very different, uh, where it's much less boots on the ground, it's much more dependent upon enabling uh, the, the actors that you have in country, the, the, uh, the uh, Syrian uh, Free Army and so forth, uh, in order to be able to do what they have the potential to do as opposed to the United States trying to do it itself. So I, I think that's what you're going to see uh, as the ultimate uh, uh, outcome in that. Okay. Another question. Yes, sir. Uh, my name is Lindsay Neese. Um, Colonel, is it? Kachikian? Kachikian, yeah. I got trouble with it too, so don't worry about it. <laughs> uh, as, in regards to what needs to be done, I appreciate your, your Paul Kennedy argument about it's the economy. It's going to drive everything. Colonel Dunn, your point about we need to deal with facts, the metrics, I appreciate. Baker, your point about we need to resolve political differences, which is the, the core of the issue with sequestration. Great. Are you all implicitly saying that you're satisfied with the narrative provided by the Joint Chiefs? I don't have that narrative. <laughs> well, let, let me look at that from the purely civilian perspective. Um, and you understand this probably as best as anybody, is that people that um, are confined to the policy world um, particularly on Capitol Hill and at the uh, higher reaches of the executive branch, guard their prerogatives very jealously. Military people are supposed to be helping inform policy and not acting politically. Now, occasionally a military officer will put his stars on the table and say, I can't stand this anymore. That should be done very rarely. Um, and so that I don't think that it is fair for us in the policy community at the same time to jealously guard our prerogatives and then expect the professionals in the military or other elements of the bureaucracy, the Foreign Service, the intelligence community or whatever to bail us out. Um, so that um, um, I, I tend to think that uh, with civilian control of the military in particular, that's important. And so that my tendency is not to put these problems on the, uh, on the shoulders of the military officers. That's not really their proper role. That's, that's my opinion. Now, people who have military experience on both sides of me may have a slightly different perspective on that. Well, the, you know, the role of a service chief uh, is to be an advocate for his, his or her service. Uh, and they're going to do that. And, and on being military people, they're, they're never going to have enough. You know, you're never going to be ready enough. You're never going to have enough ammunition, enough armor, uh, enough training funds and so forth. And, and it should be that. I mean, that's what you expect them to do. Uh, and then you go over to the Congress, and the Congress has to help prioritize things. You need to sort through all that, you know. Uh, I want to have a finite amount. How do I maintain the balance in this? What is enough? And you have to, you know, military preparedness is not like a bond where you're going to get a return on that. But I can see how well it's going every day. I check my stock market funds. Uh, it's like an insurance policy. You only got to know if it's broken when you, you do have a fire. And you look, you pull out to your insurance policy, you find, oh my gosh, I had a $5,000 deductible on that, and, and so forth. So uh, you have to look at, at that balance. And, and the, the great thing about, uh, about the United States is we do have that balance. You have uh, a full spectrum of, uh, of perspectives on things. You have the balance uh, among the different uh, pieces of government and so forth. And at the end of the day, the big thing is to, is to come coalesce around a general understanding of what you're trying to accomplish and how we maintain that balance. You can't possibly meet all the different requirements. Military is, you know, is just one of those things. You can't bankrupt the country in order to have a, a uh, ironclad uh, military capability, but you have to have sufficient uh, out there so that you know, if things don't go right, uh, you still have the ability to, to, to fix them if they do go wrong. Uh, let me just make the gratuitous uh, uh, economic point on that, which is that, let's be clear here, the United States today is not the Soviet Union in the late 1980s. Our defense budget is not the source of our economic problems, and I'll just leave it at that.
<laughs> Kerry, do you have anything to add to that? Well, I would say behind Clinton back to the uh, folks in uniform and the folks that are civilians, that are policymakers, I'm sure there's a lot of vigorous, open, and frank discussions going on behind closed doors. With military, their role, again, to be advisors, is once a decision is made, they got to salute and execute. They may not like it, but it's their job, it's their mission, it's the part of their profession to follow those lawful policies and regulations. And so it is rare if you see something, um, uh, you know, someone put their stars on the table and come out publicly and say it. You can bet that uh, behind closed doors, uh, they, are pro they are making the case for what needs to be done from their perspective and being the advocate for uh, the military. I, I can't help myself. I have to answer this one, too. Uh, the, <laughs> and, and I agree with everything in both perspectives of, of the role of the military in, in these public discussions. But I, as a former military guy who understands all the constraints, understands all the rules, I was disappointed that prior to the election, only one of the chiefs said that sequestration was going to be a problem for his service and that was General Amos, the Commandant of the Marine Corps. Everybody else said, oh yeah, we're not having any problems with this at all. Now, in their, to their defense, they were told not to plan for it. Just ignore it, it's not gonna be a problem. So that, that was the line they took. And then the, we had New Year, and everyone went, holy smoke, this is really gonna happen. Now everybody's screaming bloody murder. The problem with that is I think they're all telling the truth now, but they were either muzzled or they felt constrained by the policy debates and their role in the military not to speak so that prior to the election that did not come out and i think that's that was a mistake it was a mistake tactically for the chiefs i think it was a mistake for the nation because it didn't really get the the cards out on the table it should have been there but that's my personal opinion other questions come on folks we had lots of good info here somebody's got to have another question oh i'm behind the post thank you uh, Terry Campo, and uh, thank you, gentlemen, for your service. I was f fortunate enough to be uh, three weeks too young for Vietnam service, and have never complained about that. I uh, have a my question is sort of two par two parts, same th same theme. Why is it we need a tail of ten to one for every soldier in the field? And closely related to that is why uh, at the Pentagon and in Crystal City do we have uniform personnel trained for combat performing essentially clerical and bureaucratic jobs. Thank you. Uh, well, you're obviously not the first person to uh, ask uh, either of those uh, questions. Um, let me ask, the, the second one is probably a little easier to answer. Uh, there has, you know, when you start to cut back on things, a very easy thing to do is to start cut, cutting back on contractors. It, it was apparent to the military a number of years ago uh, that it was probably more cost efficient to take a retired, a retired lieutenant colonel who was working at a test, had been working at a uh, desk job in the Pentagon and take him back as a civilian contractor and have him do that same role rather than having to replace him every two years with another lieutenant colonel and so forth. And so this rose to the, this led to a significant increase in the number of contractors because that same thing pertains to maintenance training at all of the bases uh, where you're training, you know, radar technicians and all these other folks, very complex stuff. Uh, so, but that's also very easy to cut. You know, I'm going to cut that number of contractors and, and, and so forth. So uh, when you do that, somebody still has to do the job and you end up with, uh, with somebody in the military do, doing it. Now, I will also tell you that in some cases, those are very uh, important developmental programs. That lieutenant colonel who serves in the Pentagon for two years comes away with a better understanding of how the, how the system works. So if he comes back as a colonel or a, or a general and so forth and has to work with the congressional committees or DOD and so forth, it's a lot better than some guy who spent all his time running around the Hindu Kush, uh, you know, chasing the Taliban. So there, there's that dimension to it. Uh, in terms of the, of the tooth versus tail ratio, uh, why do you need all of these uh, sustainers and so forth? You really, uh, it, it, there is mathematical approaches to that where you can actually say, in order to keep this aircraft flying, uh, I need to have so many uh, maintenance hours to do it, which is so many mechanics and so forth. For each mechanic, I need three cooks to keep them fed. For each cook, I need to have so many car carrying fuel and so forth. So you can actually do some pretty good 
uh, mathematical analysis uh, of the tooth-to-tail ratio that is, is actually been getting an awful lot better. Uh, in Vietnam, it was something like one guy in the field and nine people in the rear, and I think it was much less than that uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan. But of course, a lot of that is because uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan, you had a lot more contractors doing those things that you had uh, people in uniform doing that. Yeah, that's a good point. One other thing, I, those are great comments. Uh, one other thing that strikes me is, I'm not sure who exactly you're pointing to and all that, but you know, uh, on the ground side, I've got friends, colleagues, people I know that have done three and four tours in combat and been separated from their families. Families need to be healed. And, and uh, so I have no objection when someone comes out of combat for a year, putting them in an assignment where they can be somewhat stable and, you know, meet their kids again. And uh, so there's probably an element of that, too, is trying to allow folks to recover from combat operations. That's a, so there's a, it's a multi-dimensional piece, but that's the piece that, that uh, Rich hadn't touched on. He did a nice job. All right, I'm, I'm going to ask another one. Um, given that uh, I took Baker's point, I was a really eloquent way to put it, that we're not the Soviet Union in the 80s, and mm -hmm. that the, mil you know, the military and military spending is not the genesis of our, our country's economic problems. That being said, anyone who's ever worked in the Pentagon mm -hmm. recognizes that it is not the most efficient organization in the world, uh, though I have to tell you, for those of you that have never been in the other parts of the government, it runs like a finely tuned Swiss watch compared to some <laughs> other parts of the government. Uh, but how, you know, given that we are in a resource-constrained environment, regardless of whether it's at sequestration levels, pre-sequestration levels, whatever, we're, we've got resource constraints. Uh, what are some of the things, just a couple of them quick, you don't have to go into massive depth, that uh, DOD and the nation could do to be more efficient so that we get more bang right. for the buck out of our military? So the military right now is, has been historically aligned on being effective at the expense of efficiency, being effective, making sure you can get that job done. So sometimes you have a little bit extra, a little bit of redundancy, because if, if plan A goes down the drain, I need a plan B. And so you have... Uh, you have a shift now. So we're now looking for more efficiency. And of course, information technology allows us to leverage some of that. The biggest thing that strikes me is acquisition reform. This is a strategic opportunity we need to seize. Equipment costs more than it needs to. And, and procurement's just one piece of the defense budget. There's a lot of other pieces. So I'm just I'm honing in on one piece. It takes longer to procure and it costs more because we smother our acquisition system with a ton of rules and a ton of lawyers. You get an, if you're in industry, and I've been both in industry and in the military, you get a request for proposal, document this thick, the first five or six pages tell you what the government wants, and the remaining 95 pages tell you what they're going to do to you if you fail to comply with these thousand laws. And so all of that causes extra people, extra work, just to try to manage that and make sure you're compliant. And that's what drives up cost and time because everybody in that acquisition system, many of the stakeholders, have the ability to say no and stop something, but nobody owns the whole system and can say, sit down, drive on, we need to move forward. So, you know, uh, I think one of the things we can look at, and uh, this will probably uh, create a little bit of a stir, but I think we need to take the some of the constraints off of our acquisition officials. We need to empower them. And if you're wor and worried about keeping them honest, let's pay them more and let's give them a poly every year, a polygraph. So before they get their bonus, they come in to take a poly. Okay? But I want them to do what's in the best interest of our nation. I heard an interesting analogy the other day. It's in the healthcare sector. One of the few minimally regulated procedures in the healthcare sector is LASIK eye surgery. Okay? It is not regulated anywhere near anything else is. It is cheap, fast, and effective. Okay? You got everybody out of the way, and you let doctors work with people. I think that's kind of instructive. Yeah, I, I, would, I would second that with regard to acquisition. I think that if we're going to have a, a system that is reformed, we've got to deregulate it to a significant degree, which is counterintuitive, particularly for people that look at the issue from Capitol Hill's perspective. Um, but uh, um, I think that that is true. Uh, 
the sheer numbers drive you in the direction of personnel reform, both civil and civilian and military. Um, and there's a variety of ways to do that. Um, we have a proposal on the military side with regard to retirement and health care that are, that are focused more on defined uh, contribution plans. Um, that would be, in my judgment, fair for all the people that serve in the military, particularly on the retirement program side, um, as well as um, reinforcing the same things that we I think we need to do as a country with regard to um, entitlement reform and, uh, and and how we manage issues like uh, like health care and, and retirement for the population as a whole. Uh, interestingly enough, um, I think that you could have significant savings in that and still do right by the people that are serving in the military for those on the on the military side in particular because their their programs in these areas are much more a defined benefit approach than even for the civilian public sector um, is to is to give them tax benefits tax benefits that they can carry for life um, and 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 the result of that uh, have some outlay savings on, on on the DOD side that you could put to better things let me just uh, add a, a comment on acquisition reform. Having been in the defense industry for about 15 years and, and, and tried to watch that operate, the defense industry, as you probably well know, operates under the, the Federal Acquisition re uh, re uh, Regulation, which is known as the FAR. Uh, and the rule of thumb when we were talking about it, uh, where I worked, was that uh, it probably adds 20 percent to the cost of any particular uh, item that you have. The other thing, too, is, you know, we, the, we tend to be very, very uh, inflexible in changing things. And I, I just offer you one example, uh, unmanned systems. Uh, unmanned systems, particularly uh, on the, uh, on the uh, airborne side, uh, create just tremendous efficiencies because you don't have crews, you don't have people you have to pay retirement for, or all of those other requirements. So if you're looking to, you know, how do I economize and get the most out of the available people that I do have, how, what sort of systems can you, in fact, replace a man in the cockpit with a, uh, with a, uh, with a computer? Uh, and there you really said it's the institutional... Uh, resistance to change, uh, and I will say it, uh, you can compare the Air Force's approach uh, to airborne ISR with what the Navy is doing. Uh, one institution is tremendously resistant to change in that, but the other uh, institution, the Navy, has, has adopted it pretty much wholeheartedly in some major mission areas, and I think they're going to reap some major uh, benefits in terms of manpower uh, reductions uh, because of that. Okay, question right here. Hi, Doug Brooks, again, a consultant with the stability operations industry. And I wonder, getting to the sufficiency question, if we can't uh, revisit how we use contractors and where we should use contractors, and it seems like we've sort of been investigating that, and it's been quite controversial. But, you know, I'm going to throw out the big question here. You have, you have ex-military people doing competitive services and offering efficiencies. What about the whole tanker program? I mean, essentially, this aerial tanker program is a huge, huge drain on the budget. Why not outsource that? And we are to a certain extent already, but it's really sort of one of the really big puzzles to me is how much money can we spend on a single program that really is not a combat program, but it's something that I think the off-the-shelf services can provide. I'd be real interested in your perspective on that. Um, I, have a, I have actually a cousin who's a refueler, though he probably wants to protect his job. But uh, uh, I'm not a subject matter expert in this. But, you know, there's alternative models to acquiring capability rather than just buying it. Leasing it is an option. Of course, the military first person thinks, when I go to war, do I really own this asset? Or now are there contracts between me and tasking somebody to do something? You know, will these contractors and those assets really fly into a hot zone? How close do these tankers really get to a fight? They're going to be key targets, right? Our enemies will want to drop those big flying gas tank, gas stations. And so I'm sure there's a lot of consideration about where they're placed, but, it, but it, that gets into the risk question in the military person's mind, is what services uh, is, am I willing to outsource that, like a food service? Okay, I get that. I'd rather have a trigger puller than somebody in the, in the chow hall slinging chow, and so I will, I'll, I'll outsource that um, in many cases. When you, as closer you get to the front lines, then the more question you have. And then it just gets into another policy thing about contractors and civilians on the battlefield. Are they allowed to be armed or not? You know, uh, are they allowed to drink alcohol or not? There's just a ton of policy issues associated with 
bringing people closer and closer to the forward ed, uh, to the to where the combat operations are going on. And so all that is part of the calculus. I don't have the answer, but I, I absolutely agree. We need to look at options other than just straight out procurement. Leasing should be a consideration or other structures that if they can make us uh, more effective, more agile, you know, and still keep the risks mitigated. Yeah, I'm sorry, go ahead. Um, I would say that uh, I would certainly start with the things that should be relatively easy, which is the question of public-private partnerships and our depots that are um, maintaining and, uh, in some cases, uh, modestly upgrading the weapon systems that we have under the rubric uh, performance-based logistics. Um, there are other elements of, of performance-based uh, logistics that do go forward into the field, and then they start to run into the problems that were just described, but at least it seems to me that you could start with those easier examples. <coughs> the other thing I would add is, you know, you get back to basic numbers, and I think some, <clears throat> some good quantitative analysis and a, and a fresh look at the world would be, would be useful in that regard. The number of tankers you have is a function of how many, uh, how many fighter aircraft uh, are required, how many orbits each one, uh, how long are your air bridges that you have to be able to uh, refuel for and so forth. So you really kind of need to look at the, at the front end of that equation to then determine how many uh, tankers of what type that you would need uh, at, at the back end. Uh, and again, uh, those are some of the sorts of missions that it would make infinite good sense uh, to put a computer in the cockpit uh, rather than, uh, than the protoplasm. You know, where you don't have to, those computers have a very low pension rates and so forth. <laughs> so, uh, but I, again, it's uh, that sort of out, box, uh, out of the box thinking, if you will, that, that is, you run into some institutional challenges from because the people who fly tankers, you know, they have Congress people and, and everything else. So you run into that institutional change challenge. Uh, and the good news is crisis, which is, you're a little bit on right now in terms of hollowing out the force, uh, can be, in fact, a, a very effective impediment or imp impetus for, uh, for change. Driver. Okay, I'm going to exercise the moderator's prerogative again. And uh, I'd like, this is going to be your closing remarks. I'm just going to throw this out there. So if you want to ignore this part of it, you can and just say whatever you want in closing because mm -hmm. I can't stop you. But uh, I have to ask this for Captain Bucci. Uh, and, and all of his mates uh, out there wearing a uniform today. Uh, right now, I think everybody, at least at this table, would think the United States probably has the best military in the world. We've got the best training, the best equipment, the best people today. Some of them are a little tired. Some of the equipment is, is reaching the, the ending edge of its lifetime, but it's, we still got the best. But below a certain size and, and, and a certain age of that equipment, that elite status, it, it starts to wear a little thin. I remember my dad telling me when I was in high school that, that a really good small player in football was always going to get beaten by a really good big player uh, pretty much every time. Uh, how do we today husband the advantages that we have the things we've learned over the last 10 years, some of them good, some of them bad, but you learn from both of those. Uh, how do we husband that advantage so that as we go forward, uh, while we may not be surpassed by anybody else, but last time I checked, we didn't really like going into fair fights, uh, and we want to keep it that way. And I know I want to keep it that way for Captain Bucci. Uh, so what... With that sort of general thought in mind, you get two to three minutes each for closing remarks, and uh, and we'll wrap it up. You're well, okay, I'll be the guinea pig here. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't anticipate this question. Should have. I wasn't ready. Readiness level was down. Um, <laughs> I like the, uh, the the stool analogy, the three-legged stool. I think it's brilliant. It's very simple, but you know when you cut off one leg of the stool to save money, it's no longer a stool, is it? So what does that tell me? I'm going home and buying four-legged stools in case I lose one. I might be able to still stand. But anyway, um, I think a couple things that haven't been touched on here that need to be part of this because it's really a system. And trying to do Band-Aid approaches isn't always effective. But we, we touched a little bit on it, but policies. Policies about recruiting, retention, compensation, retirement, a, a, of alignment of the modernized force with the fiscal realities that we have has to be touched. Politics is big. Politics, we're in Washington, D.C., right? I don't, that's preaching to the choir. We need to put our national interests ahead of personal interests. It's hard to do because we all have past experiences 
and we all have advocacy and all of that. The military folks generally are better at that because they've taken an oath and support and defend the Constitution and they'll have their own opinions, absolutely. Often can't voice them publicly. But we really do need to have more of a, a viewpoint of doing what's in the national interest rather than personal interests. Um, I think another way to mitigate some of this risk is we're going to rely more on intelligence. The better intelligence we have the, uh, reduces uncertainty and we can take some more risk. The challenge here is the national and the military intelligence programs are also being squeezed. So, you know, the, uh, the, I think one of the key things here is um, as we go forward, look at what's the end goal. We've got to have flexible forces that are highly tailorable, they're well trained, but, and, but we also need to look at, we can't service all of the missions that the government has expected us to do. We've been very good at doing less, we're doing more with less for decades. Now we've got to face the reality of doing less with less. Because that drives a lot of this, all of every agreement we sign, every alliance we have around, around the world has secondary tertiary impacts about what the costs are. And that drives a lot of that. Um, I suppose my watch where would be to say is the legitimate, as legitimate as they are, um, don't over learn the lessons uh, from uh, the unfortunate experience of the past, particularly with regard to the 1970s. Obviously that was the crux of my remarks. Um, I'm, a, I'm a little bit different um, here insofar as um, uh, I think there is a constituency for maintaining readiness and it consists of the scaredy cat constituency. They look at the 1970s and they say, we're not going to do that again. And so I'm afraid that what's going to happen is, is that we're going to shrink the force, shrink its capabilities to a certain degree, forego modernization to make sure that these unit readiness things never recur that we saw in the 1970s, while ignoring these problems about criticality on size and modernization um, and, and making sure that the, that the force is properly uh, armed and equipped. Um, uh, yeah, you can get down to, you know, some very modest number of army divisions and make sure each of those divisions are really the best that we've ever seen, but that's not a real fighting force. And so that, uh, again, I think that the watchword that we've seen um, in all of the presentations today is really more about, um, again, balance. Um, uh, I'm afraid that uh, I'm afraid that in this particular case we we're, we're running a greater risk of erring on the side of a for, on the side of a force that's too small and not adequately equipped in the first instance, meaning new generations of weapons and equipment, as opposed to one that has poor personnel, p low morale, um, and is not being trained properly. That's not to say those aren't really serious concerns in the greater scheme of things, and that they weren't the serious problems about the hollow force in the 1970s, but if all you do is address that nest of issues, then I still think you're going to get it wrong at the end of the day. Well, this is, this is tough stuff. I mean, if you've been ba managing to pay attention here for an hour and a half, uh, God bless you. I mean, <laughs> th these issues will make your hair hurt if you think about them too long. <laughs> uh, and so the, the challenge, I think, really lies on that side of the podium with, with you all out there. These are very complex issues. They're very important. Uh, when you deal with things like this, the most important thing that the United States has going for it is an informed and an engaged citizenry. Uh, and so you we need to be able to take these, these very complex things. We have many people out there. You don't have the percentage of veterans that you used to have in this country. So people don't have a firsthand awareness of what happens when you can't fix your truck or you don't have ammunition to train with before you're going down the road. They don't know that because a very small percentage of our population has served. <coughs> so it really falls upon institutions like Heritage and media and the Congress and so forth to educate and engage our population. So we, we understand that, you know, these are important things. They need to be dealt with. And they need to be put in, a, in proper priorities. We need to look at these particular things. And uh, God bless you. I mean, that's your responsibility out there. We can help. But uh, taking that message and taking it out to, the, uh, to our informed, engaged citizens is, is probably the number one thing that we have to do right now. Thank you. All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I, hopefully this was an, an auspicious kickoff for our month, not, not a 
ha ha kind of happy send off, but <laughs> this is this is serious business, and uh, we we do think about this all year round, not just during this month, but uh, in the month of May we try and put a little more emphasis on it. And again, I'd encourage you to pick up the flyer so you know what else is going to go on this month. A lot of good programs, a lot of good discussion, but we want the feedback from you. We you are part of this, you know, heritage and and find speakers like this do do what we do to arm all of you so that you can be that informed citizenry that, that Rich was talking about. Because what we're dealing with here is what I think the most precious asset we have in our nation, and that's our, our young men and women, because they're the ones who have to go do this stuff we decide that they should do. And uh, we care about that very, very much. Please join me in thanking our panel. And we hope you'll come back to some of our future events, and there's a lot of stuff outside to uh, pick up as you go out. Thank you very much.